When it comes to our current day and age, there are some hard truths that people sadly have to accept. One of which is that the state of trust between the police forces of the world, especially in places like Russia and the United States, aren't at good levels. In the US, especially over the last several years, various police officers have been involved in shootings, raids, and more that were not just racist, but done under false pretenses, and even ended up costing innocent people their lives. Which brings us to Stephen Avery, who has had a lot of dealings with a police force that seemed to have it out for him. So allow us to ask, were the cops corrupt in the Stephen Avery case? To understand the various elements of corruption that went on here, you have to look at all the elements of the two cases that drastically affected Avery's life. So let's get to the first one because it's very telling on multiple levels. In July of 1985, a woman named Penny Bernstein was assaulted and violated while on a jog one day. During a photo lineup, she said it was Avery who was the attacker. You'd think that this would be a pretty definitive statement as she was the one assaulted and thus would know the face of her attacker. But in this case, that wasn't true. Avery was 40 miles away in Green Bay shortly after the attack, supported by an alibi that included a time-stamped story receipt and 16 eyewitnesses. One eyewitness can be swayed, but a group of them and a timestamp receipt proving he wasn't anywhere close to the attack? That proves he didn't do it, except he was arrested and charged with the crime, getting 32 years in jail for it. What's worse is that two different appeal attempts were denied in subsequent years, so that in and of itself was an injustice against Stephen Avery, but sadly, it would keep coming. In 1995, a detective made a call to the jail that Avery was at and noted that an inmate that an inmate had admitted committing an assault years ago in Manitowoc County and that someone else was in jail for it. The sheriff at the jail didn't believe him and thus Avery remained in jail. Think about that for a second. A fellow officer was telling them that they had the wrong guy and they didn't even consider it. They didn't even look into it to see if there was even a chance that they were wrong. That is another injustice and one that would make the police look like fools later on. Because when it came to his release that came in 2002 when the Innocent Project used DNA evidence to prove that Avery was innocent and that a man named Gregory Allen had done the deed. What's important to note here is that Allen and Avery honestly did look alike. So the witness that put him away honestly wasn't corrupt, rather she was just a victim of a case of mistaken identity, which sadly happens much more than you realize in the criminal justice system. But while that may get her off the hook in its own way, that doesn't get the cops off the hook because they know better than most of that eyewitness testimony is sketchy at best and yet they trusted the one victim who was under duress and had to try and remember her attacker versus the 16 people who saw Stephen Avery in a store 40 miles away alongside technology proving he was there. So if that's not corrupt, we don't know what is. Avery certainly felt slighted to the point where he went and sued the county for wrongdoing that went on in the case and that happened right as another case was brought before him. Number 4. Teresa Hallback Teresa Hallback was a simple photographer born in 1980. 25 years later in early November she went missing and her parents called in to the police to let them know that their daughter was missing. Now before you think that their parents were just overreacting. They hadn't seen her in a couple days and she lived right next door to them, so if anyone would notice, they would be her parents that she was gone. Hallbeck was known to have visited the Avery Salvage Yard in Manitowoc County on October 31, 2005, just days before her death. On November 10, 2005, following the discovery of her Toyota RAV4 partially concealed on the Avery property, Calumet County Sheriff Jerry Pagel conducted a search and found the charred remains of Hallback, her cell phone, license plates, and car keys as well. Fast forward a few days and Stephen Avery's blood was found in her vehicle as well, a clear sign that he was involved in part or in whole with what happened to her, or at least that's what the officers involved with the case said. Avery was charged with the kidnapping and murder of Hallback, mutilation of a corpse and illegal possession of a firearm, which you'd think would mean this was a clear cut case and by the book, right? Wrong. Number 3. Conflicts of Interest there are multiple points in the Teresa Hallback case that have gotten some people saying it was corrupt from the start. For example, some of the county sheriffs and law enforcement who were involved in proving Avery guilty of the previous crime were allowed to investigate the new case despite there being a civil suit by Avery against them. And some of the key evidence was indeed found by them. 
But as Avery's lawyers noted multiple times, not only was there a conflict of interest, there was evidence that was clearly tampered with, including a vial of Avery's blood from his wrongful conviction that had been unsealed and a puncture wound was in the top as if to draw blood from the vial. Avery himself noted that this was a frame up because of his suing the county for what they did to him. Another controversy that came about was that of his nephew, Brendan Ray Dassey, who confessed to helping Avery with the attack on Teresa. But later he recanted as he said he was coerced by cops, they didn't let him have a lawyer present. They claimed to use legal methods, but many have disputed that over the years, especially after making a murderer came out and shined the light on the events surrounding the case. But sadly, there was potentially more corruption revealed later on. Number two, Thomas Sawinski. Who is Thomas Sawinski? A new witness that was revealed by Stephen Avery's lawyer and who had a very interesting set of things to say about not just what he saw during the time of Teresa Hallback's disappearance, but how the police handled him. Apparently, he was delivering newspapers to the Avery salvage yard during the early morning hours of November 5, 2005, when he saw a shirtless Bobby Dassey and an unidentified older man pushing a dark blue RAV4 down Avery Road toward the junkyard. Bobby Dassey is the nephew of Avery and was a star witness for the prosecution. The other man, according to this new witness, was in his 50s and 60s, while Avery at the time of the murder in 2005 was in his 40s and didn't match the physical description of that man either. Sawinski said that Bobby tried to block him from exiting the property, but he drove into a ditch to get around him and was able to leave. He then went on to claim that he called the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office to report his encounter with Bobby, but was told by an officer, we already know who did it. Number one, why do this to Avery? That's the question, isn't it? If the cops were corrupt, why did they do this to Avery? There are a lot of possibilities, but one that sticks out is that Avery, due to his own troubles with the law, which he did have, but he never previously killed anyone for the record, and his own mental deficiencies, he was the perfect person to fit the bill of the crime. Sadly, there have been many cases where innocent people are put behind bars because police don't do a thorough investigation, which is why Avery was sent away the first time. The second case is even more concerning as police of the area, who again, were being sued by Avery, should not have been allowed to do anything concerning Avery, and yet they did, possibly because they felt that they could put Avery away for the right reasons this go around, it would take the stain off their name. Instead, with all the inconsistencies and the new witness stating that he was turned away by them, they've revealed themselves to possibly be even more corrupt than before. And if Avery is proven innocent again, there will be a lot to answer for. So what do you think of this look at the case of Stephen Avery and how it's very possible that he was indeed persecuted unjustly by cops who oversaw his case? Do you personally think that the cops were corrupt in his two cases? Do you think that the government of Wisconsin is also trying to bury Stephen Avery so that he can't do more damage to them? Or is there something else at play here? Let us know in the comments below and we'll see you next time on the channel.